Okay. All right, everybody. Welcome to the next episode of the Earth in Hand podcast. Today, I am honored to interview natural builder Carol Cruz. Welcome, Carol. Thank you. Honored to be here. Great to have you here. Yeah, it's been a while. We're, We're just catching up and talking about old times and and future plans. Mm -hmm. Um, I remember you and I met in person once in New Mexico. I think it was back in, I don't know, 2010 or somewhere in there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got to go and see your beautiful Adobe dome home Mm -hmm. and all your artwork. And I was just so impressed, you know, made a huge impression on me and, uh, And I always tell people about your works and I show slides of some of your artworks in a lot of my workshops. Oh, wonderful. For many years. Nice. So yeah, welcome. You're just, you're just one of the, uh, the gems of the natural building community and a a real elder and it's just wonderful. I'm an elder now. (laughs) Yeah. Well, a true elder with actual wisdom. So. Well, I hope so. It's just wonderful to, uh, you know, be in touch with you and, and get that, uh, um, absorb some of that wisdom. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, um, you know, I know a little bit about your, your earlier days, but if you can go back and tell our audience um, just a little bit about, you know, your, your childhood you know you grew up in New Mexico I know you're around Adobe all the time and kind of how you slowly realized that Adobe was uh, a path for you to take and your experience in in uh, seeing the materials working with them and you know at what age you eventually started working with these materials a lot okay well um yeah I I Grew up in Ranchos de Taos in an old adobe house and uh, watched them remud the church down the road and watched the neighbors building with adobe and fixing their houses and and watched my mother work on the walls a little bit and and, uh, it just seemed like a natural thing to do but then I went to college at the University of Texas and was away from the mud for some time but I was an art major I did a little bit of work with ceramics but um I got really fascinated with color and uh did a a big series of um one value uh geometric paintings and um then, you know, I finished college and I was really lonesome from New Mexico and came back and rented an old adobe house in Santa Fe, lived there for a while, <clears throat> and then got the opportunity to <clears throat> work on uh, an old adobe horse stable and turn it into a solar house for my ex-husband and I. And so we did that and that was really my first building experience and I made bricks and you know stacked them learned how to plaster and when that was done I was so fascinated with the natural colors of the earth and and what you could do with the plasters and the way that the the pigment absorbs into the clay and that sort of thing that I did a series of um of panels, you know, uh, like two and a half by three feet panels and did artwork on those. And so that taught me a whole lot about the materials and plastering and what worked and what didn't. And um, then we left that house that we built and bought a really old adobe in Talpa 
and uh, I lived, ended up living there for over 20 years. But in the meantime, my ex and I were splitting up and I needed a backup plan, you know, because I didn't think I'd get to keep that house. So I started building um, my Adobe Dome and was very influenced by Jean-Louis and Cara Lee of of spectacular vernacular fame. And Mm -hmm. Cara Lee especially was very into domes. And so she said, if I built the walls, she'd put together a workshop to come and do the roof. So we did that, and um, and then um, you know during the workshop we could only move very slowly on that roof because you can only have um, two people up there on the scaffolding laying bricks at a time because they have to be very tight and they have to come together you know it's a one by one thing so we we got up a ways but and then I finished it pretty soon. And it was a thrilling process to build a dome, I must say. It's, it's you're, you're defying gravity in a, in a way that's really magical. So yeah, it really is. And that was a real life-changing experience to build my own place with, and do it just the way I wanted. And, and I was really enjoying the plastering and everything. And then, um, Michael Smith from Cobb Cottage Company came to town and saw it and said, this would be a great place to have a workshop. And so we had one there and built the sleeping nook and kitchenette. And uh, it was so great to be connected to a group like that, natural builders and people interested in all that. And so I got invited to teach at the natural building colloquia and did so for about 20 years. So I ended up teaching a lot of young builders how to do the finish work and worked up at Llama Foundation a lot when we had the build here now after their fire and- Yeah, I heard a lot about that. I never made it out there, but- That was great. I've seen a lot of the buildings out there and it's just incredible. Yeah, Yeah. beautiful work up there at Llama. And a nice location, really. Yeah, it's really wonderful. But, but yeah, the just, maintenance um, is difficult. Going back one step, sorry. The um, <clears throat> I just want the audience to be aware of that book that you mentioned, that spectacular vernacular book. Yeah, it's uh, just a wonderful book. It's really a gem. Yeah. Yeah, so that influenced me a lot. I, I read the book before I met John Louis and Carol Lee, so... Okay. It's really great to make friends with them. Yeah, that was one of the first books that I got, you know, after taking a workshop with Yanto Evans. Mm-hmm. He recommended a certain set of books, you know, like uh, nice. Hassan Fatih and uh, yeah. Architecture Without Architects and mm-hmm. uh, Craftsman of Necessity and the Spectacular Vernacular book. Yeah. Uh, in addition to the book that he wrote with uh, Michael Smith, you know. Right. Which I already had that one. I had the, the Cobber's Companion and the yeah. you know, Sculpted House. But uh, yeah, Yanto really inspired a whole generation of builders. Really yeah, he, he was very influential for me. And interestingly enough, I never even talked to Michael Smith until uh, a couple weeks ago. Oh. I just, I had never reached out and I, I sent him an email. Of course, you know, he knew who I was, but uh, he's in the process of writing a book. I don't know if you know, he's no, writing a book know. right now with uh, Massey Burke and uh, oh, cool. another author. And uh, anyway, um, they're looking for photos of Cobb homes in the process. Um, so yeah, maybe, I don't know if it's too late, but you should get some of your photos in that book. So. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and then I also wanted to, uh, I forgot in the introduction, I want to make sure our audience is aware of this wonderful book that you wrote that's one of my favorites. This is uh, Carol Cruz, Clay Culture. And this book has it all, folks. This book is (laughs) wonderful. It's a a lot of stories from your life, Carol, and it's also uh, 
you know, a lot of technical information about Adobe building, about finishes, and a lot of the cultural and uh, traditional background um, from New Mexico is covered in here. Interesting uh, history also. So just want to make Thanks. sure people are aware yeah. that you authored this book. And, and one of my favorites, I actually have a signed copy here. Oh, great. Yeah. <laughs> I might have to get more printed. I'm almost out. <laughs> yeah, it's a good one. Um, yeah, and so you you built your dome, and then you lived in your dome for you. You still well, live there. I, I I live in it part time. I mm -hmm. I never did end up having to live there full time, but I rented it out to um, young couples a few times, and. Uh, they enjoyed it and you know because I still had my house in Talpa I was able to keep it after all and I had kids in school and everything so it was hard to move that far out in the country right you know. okay but I love having it and I think eventually I want to turn it into a little retreat center so mm -hmm. this summer I want to develop some uh, campsites make swales on the hillside and, and develop campsites that, that have their own little um, outhouse in a swale and yeah. uh, fertilize the land that way, catch really? water and, and uh, develop it some more. Oh yeah. Yeah, that sounds like a gold mine right there. Yeah, I think it would make an excellent retreat space. And my uh, middle daughter is, uh, becoming a therapist and you know she could hold retreats of various kinds out there mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because the dome itself is so magical for a group to sit in together and you can really hear each other and yeah focus. very special acoustics in the dome yeah so i've had a lot of natural building workshops out there but I think it's time to shift it now to another kind of work. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's been some uh, some new developments uh, for myself also in the direction of bioarchitecture. So mm -hmm. <clears throat> I always knew intuitively that this Adobe materials and the natural materials, they just feel wonderful. You know, you have a, a building made out of these and it, it feels correct. It feels calming and, yes. and it's so beautiful. So um, now as I've met a uh, pretty famous uh, physicist and uh, scientist, Dan Winter, mm. who studies the physics of consciousness, among other things, he's kind of a polyglot um, and made connections with him. I joined the bioarchitects group. That's a group that he initiated um, with uh, folks like Juan Schlosser and Michael Rice and and uh, Arturo and Lydia Ponce de Leon. And they're all very accomplished, uh, you know, sacred geometers and, and mm -hmm. they design buildings that support the uh, living biofield. And mm -hmm. it's, it's no longer something that we, you know, talk about in terms of like auras, although I, I like the word auras, but they use uh, the biofield and uh -huh. talking about it in more, um, you know, provable terms where we have measurements now, we have antennas and software, we can measure the uh, field effect inside of buildings yeah. uh, and record measurements. Uh, oh, so that's cool. pretty exciting because it's sort of a turning point from just intuitive uh, sense of things Mm -hmm. where it's kind of your opinion sort of you know mm -hmm. to actually having uh you know scientific measurement that can back up uh what we feel and yeah. so what we're finding is that the natural materials and uh, certain shapes of buildings really do enforce the reinforce the living biofield of plants and animals um mushrooms as well so um, that's provable by you know Seed, plant seed growth um, and uh, folks might want to check out a book called uh, Seeds of Knowledge, Stone of Plenty. Hmm. Uh, 
that's from a number of years back. But in that book, they talk about how, you know, places like Stonehenge and the pyramids and so on, those places also uh, cause superior plant growth and seed germination. Um, so you're moving from like an average of like 60% seed germination to 100% seed germination oh, in particular buildings. Yeah. Of course, it's related to like the telluric energies and where exactly it's located on the earth also. Mm -hmm. Um, so dowsing comes into play and mm -hmm. anyway it's very exciting times where we're actually bringing together natural building and the materials with um, the intuitive uh, formally thought of woo woo but now very mm -hmm. clearly scientific study of bioarchitecture and uh, the biofield mm -hmm. so and it relates to your yeah. dome the, the way that it feels inside of the building um, also, the acoustics in a building, the, the, the way the sound moves inside of a building relates directly to um, the way that the frequencies, the Schumann resonance of the earth, mm -hmm. and the frequencies of the earth also move inside of that space. So the, the concentration of sound, the, the highest point of echo, would also be the highest point of energy concentration. Mm -hmm. So anyway, domes are very special, um, yeah. and I love being inside your dome, and especially the colors, the way that you made the dome spiral upward with a yeah. variety of colors, shifting, blending colors. It's it's just incredible. I painted that on uh, my daughter's, my middle daughter's 18th birthday, and she was in Europe at the time, and. Um, and I was having a workshop. Maybe you can see this here. Oh yeah, a little, bit. A little closer. Okay. Oh, that's great. Yeah. So I was. Um, I painted that in, during a workshop. It it took me about oh at least ten hours, but it was um, a very thin casein wash over the elise, and so. You know, it was it was like painting watercolors over this um, elise. So, you know, it's not like you're trying to paint heavy clay over your head. Although I had plastered the whole thing with heavy clay, but um. <laughs> right, you're putting the color on with a much thinner paint. With a much thinner process. Easier. Yeah, the ca I love casein washes over earthen plasters and elise because. You can change the color really quickly, and um, it's kind of transparent or translucent in a way, yeah. depending on the pigments you use. And the, it's so fascinating to study pigments, too. I have a little bit about them in my book, but uh, Ralph Meyer's book, The Artist's Handbook, is a wonderful resource for really learning about the pigments. And he he goes into all kinds of artistic techniques, fresco and, and all that. And, and I love some fresco too, and I plan to make some more of those. Yeah, yeah, I've never tried fresco. I've actually never tried casein paints, uh -huh. but I've played with pigments a lot and oh, you know, I teach a paints course almost every year. Mm -hmm. It's one of the more popular courses. So so easy to apply earthen paints to uh, conventional buildings. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we work with, um, a lot of people work with like American clay as it's a product mm -hmm. that you can put over drywall, but then yeah. we can pigment that in interesting ways with an Elise. Yeah. Um, and what I find, um, it's similar to what you mentioned about casein is a lot of times I want to just put like a, a little bit of a hue over something or, or paint a picture. Um, mm -hmm. I would mix uh, paints with just a, like a linseed oil with pigment. Oh, You're kind of making like an oil paint. Uh -huh. um, and so you can get a lot of interesting effects with that. Mm -hmm. And then there's sort of like this depth to it. Mm -hmm. um, it kind of reminds me of encaustic painting where yeah. there's kind of, you can get. You're putting that over clay? 
Yeah, so you might have one color of a lease and then you might do another color with a uh, oil and pigment over that and you get sort of a blend. So yeah. There's a lot of interesting possibilities there. And then also with the uh, sodium silicate right. mixtures, um, sodium silicate being water soluble, you mix it in water, but you can also add pigment to that. Yes. So painting that, you can get different kind of uh, overlay of colors and blending. It's pretty interesting, a lot of possibilities. So yeah. I'm excited to keep experimenting and maybe I'll try some casein paints, but uh, do you make your casein uh, from the from raw materials or do you buy milk. like a powder? I, I often make it from the skim milk and it's quite easy. You just uh, warm up the milk and then you add enough vinegar to make it curdle. And then you put it through a strainer mm -hmm. and rinse it off and, and take the curds. And then I sprinkle some baking soda over the curds and it softens them up really nicely. And then um, blend them up with some dissolved borax. Just sure. uh, one tablespoon per quart of milk and that alkalinizes it. And, and it makes such a nice clear uh, sealant, you know, for the walls, but yet you can go over it again with more elise or whatever. And, and I wonder in your experiments with the oil paint, with the linseed oil over the, over the clay wall, that kind of finishes it as far as putting on more, more clay, right? Well, usually that would be the last thing, That's right? Last yeah, and, thing. and depending on like if there's a lot of traffic or there's moisture present, I would do maybe several coats. Uh -huh. um, but what I found over the years is, and, and I would like to hear your opinion also, um, you know, when I have damage, especially to floors, floors often get damaged. Mm -hmm. And I might have put, you know, 10 coats of linseed oil on a floor right? And then, it, and then it gets damaged is that when I come back and repair it, um, it's really not a problem to, oh, good. to, you know, put the earth back in yeah, um, and it will bond with the uh, earth that has oil in it. And then I can uh, put more oil. It's hard to match color, but, right. but still, as far as it's structurally like blending in that I can just yeah. put new earth in there and then put more oils over it and it'll yeah. it seems to all work out but I don't um, what have you experienced anything like that well I've always been a little leery of, of using oil and wax on the wall because it does make it more difficult to make repairs and stuff but on the floor yeah you you've got to but uh, I imagine in a high traffic area and all it's nice on the walls if you don't want to change the color. Mm -hmm. Waxed walls were very popular in Santa Fe a couple decades back. Everybody was putting beeswax over their plaster. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot to consider, right? As you get more experience, you realize, well, certain techniques, it might look great, but it might be harder to fix. Harder. I think the wax and the oil on the walls does make it definitely harder to fix. Right. Um, but it's still doable. Um, yeah. And then I'm kind of just wondering about, <clears throat> you know, which I haven't done enough testing yet, you know, which one's the most durable? Because I know casein is also a binder and it will kind of make a, uh, a harder surface, similar to uh, wheat paste. Right. You know, if you well, have it's better than wheat paste, really. No. Because wheat paste, if you use it alone, it tends to crack and peel, I find. Maybe I don't thin it up enough, but I, I prefer oh, yeah. the casein for a final finish. In okay. fact, uh, I was at a house just the other day where uh, we had done the walls, <clears throat> gosh, 20 years ago, and put uh, casein wash over them. They were in perfect shape. Everywhere. Wow. It just looked so great. It looked like wow. we had just done it. So, you know, those, those casein washes really work. And you can do layers of different colors too and, and make a, a real glossy color with depth in it, you know. 
It's so beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah. yeah. And it's great when you don't have to go back and maintain things. <laughs> it is. I love yeah, that. It lasts a long time. People think that the earth isn't going to last, but if you do it correctly, and I, yeah. I was driving through uh, Southeast Portland the other day and I said, oh, I think I did a project down this street right here. And I turned down the street. I remembered right where it was. And there's these two earthen columns I did on a front porch. And they're, they're yeah. huge. I mean, they're yeah. uh, wrapped around a wood column. Uh -huh. but all I did with those was I painted them with uh, an Elise and uh, you know I I can't remember exactly your recipe but my recipe that I learned a long time ago what I use is basically uh, um, it's about a third wheat paste and then a third uh, kale and clay and then uh, one third uh, very very fine sand silica sand yeah, yeah. Um, and then I add some sodium silicate, you know, obviously. Yeah. But anyway, I made this Elise and I put that on those columns, nice orange color. Yeah. And then I put uh, two or three coats of linseed oil over that. Oh, wow. Pretty sure that's what I did. Gosh, I, oh. <laughs> do I remember right? <laughs> I think that's what it was. Anyway, those columns were looking pristine, just exactly oh. the same way as I left them. And this was, again, 20 years ago wow. in, a, in an outdoor environment. I was... That's I, was great. I expected to see chipping at the base and, and there uh -huh. wasn't none. And did moisture reach the base at all? I'd imagine so, you know, even though it's yeah. under the porch with some wind blown rain, uh, -huh. uh but not direct rain. Yeah. So not some so over rain, so. Yeah. Because I've seen linseed oil moisture get under it and then it'll peel off. You've got to really protect it from ground yeah yeah that's always the key yeah yes well that's wonderful um yeah and just going back to talking about your dome i remember when we were there we talked about all the experiments that you did in the process to kind of arrive at your um final um you know exterior waterproofing layer yeah. and uh, if we could go <laughs> through that again i think everybody might like to hear some of that that's well, That's I don't. Nice. I don't think they know about need to know about all the failures. <laughs> <laughs> okay, whatever you want to share. I, that's that's where no, the you know I part is, yeah. the best thing I did was treat it like a floor and do the linseed yeah. oil, but then because the um, whole structure expands and contracts a little bit, it made a split in that oil layer, and was starting to peel and. And that's when I put on the acrylic, that elastomeric roof coating, okay. which I love for lots of things. And in fact, I've developed a, a roof where you just paint that onto canvas. I have made a, a shade roof out of an old drop cloth painted with elastomeric on, on both sides. And it's holding up great. Okay. Except the rate. Know except there's some little dips in it that collect the water and then the ravens come and they drink the water and they poke a hole in it once in a while. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I've had to fix it here and there, but, but I think it's a great system. And I was thinking for a living roof, you could do that if you can't get your hands on the, the pond liner and you want something cheap, you could do um, canvas and elastomeric as your base and then do the, earth um, living roof over it. Brilliant. Yeah, my mind keeps going toward cheap solutions for people who don't have houses. Because yeah, I think it, it's going to get worse and worse with the oceans rising and refugees and, you know. Yeah, and just the um, in global place. economy is not doing so great and that poor people feel it, you know. I know it. And uh, the middle class might be poor real soon. <laughs> so we all got to be creative and, and work together to find the best solutions. And um, yeah, and I mean, I, I think, think more of that creativity needs to be encouraged. Yeah. I mean, instead, they just throw obstacles in our way and and don't allow this, that, and the other thing. I mean, I, I made a, a nice little model of a, um, of a cheap house to build with straw bales on the north side built in a curve for stability and just ease at building. 
And then adobe arches in the front using recycled windows, those patio door replacement windows. There's always a lot of them at the restores. Oh, I love using those. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and so I took it to the planning department here in Taos and they said, oh, you'd have to get an architect to sign off on that because it's using some alternative materials. And oh, you'd, you'd have to insulate that adobe, even though it's on the south side. And I said, what, why? You know, it's got all this insulation on the north where you need it. Yeah. And she said, oh, well, the adobe's gonna get too hot. I said, what? What? I mean, I just don't understand all, all these oh. rules and regulations. And she said, oh, and now you, you only are allowed to use milled lumber. You can't even go in the forest and get the burned trees for being. Are you kidding me? Really? I what couldn't if, believe Well, what if you cut it up yourself with a chainsaw? Is it considered milled or? I, I don't know. It probably has to have a stamp on it from some oh, man. manufacturer. And yeah, she said, you have to use um, windows with with some kind of um, coatings on them, you know, to be yeah, the low E coatings. Blah, 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 yeah. low E windows. Yeah. I mean, please, in my boyfriend's fancy house, he used those and about three quarters of them have failed and they've gotten film in yeah. the middle, you know, yeah. gets all weird it's not moisture cloudiness it's the film itself okay turns slightly opaque you know i mean it, it reflects the light in a funny way and it looks dirty and you can't really see through it very well so he's had to get a lot of them replaced and the company that provided him in the first place with a guarantee uh decided to dissolve you know. Oh, right, of course. Yes, because they were getting too many complaints. Right, right. So, so you know, you have no recourse. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's all exactly. about making money. And I just think we, we need to think more about freedom and the individual. And I agree. Yeah. Yeah, we're all well, working for that. We were but, talking about this earlier, how yeah. when I was uh, 19 years old, and I first got inspired, you know, I went to Spain, I saw the works of Gaudi, and I thought, you know, Antonio Gaudi, his works are so oh, colorful and lively and just alive and curving and, and, and long lasting and really, really high level craftsmanship. And I thought, well, I why is it when everything? I was 19 also. Okay, yeah, you get it, yeah. And you're yeah. thinking, why isn't everything this beautiful and this well right. done? Like, what is the problem here? And it, you know, it kind of comes back to, uh, the money and just the funding obviously he was really well funded yeah. um but then going through life and thinking you know i had my really clear plan from way back then from when i first started studying uh natural building and architecture in uh, 1999 i thought that within in my imagination within 10 or 15 years i thought i was going to have a piece of land and i was going to build a whole village and i was going to do workshops and nothing went that way at all mm -hmm. and it's and it's continually been um really like the economics and the regular over regulation of the owner builders yeah. um that has kind of gotten in the way and i found that you know going to other countries really opened things up for me because i was interested in ultimate efficiency the ultimate kind of uh futurist view of architecture uh which which is what bioarchitecture is working toward now. But that kind of approach is much easier to do in a lot of other countries. And sure. there are certain counties and certain places in the US where you can uh, do more experimental things or you can possibly get special permission to do experimental architecture. But for the most part, I've had the most success in you know places like Thailand and mm. Puerto Rico, <laughs> even, you know, just kind of its own thing. Um, but yeah, just places where you can simply uh, bring a nice design to the building department and pay your fee for your permit. And they say, go for it, you know? <laughs> and, you know, that has pluses and minuses, but I think freedom, more freedom is always better because, um, 
you know, basically there's so many rules in place now where it seems like it's there for the people's protection, but it actually gets in the way. And it's, is it really protecting us if we can't express ourselves and, and do what we want? And the, the whole thing of the architecture is being kind of like a personal expression. And, and like you talk about in your book, how it's traditionally in New Mexico and in other uh, places in, in America, going way back, this is something that was like the, the domicile was like the, the area where the, the women would actually, you know, create the buildings. And it was a cultural expression of something that the women would do is not just taking care of the house, but they would build the houses right. too. Yeah, that's a good part of it. At least the interior in the Spanish tradition here. Right. Yeah, but the Indians were, were building <coughs> it themselves. Yeah. Women. Yeah. Yeah, and I've been to uh, Taos Pueblo and mm -hmm. Hickory's Pueblo, and it was it was mind blowing. You know, I did I did sweat lodges there with the nice. folks, and and it was just yeah. very uh, life changing yeah. and pivotal. It's a good experience. New Mexico is a great place. Oh, I love it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love it. I got to get back there at some point. Mm -hmm. And speaking of bioarchitecture, I just learned uh, yesterday that you can put biochar in your floors and it makes them dry faster. Wow, okay. That's new one, huh? That's interesting. Yes, and you can put it, you can mix it with lime plaster and it will get rid of all your mold. I mean, the lime itself will too, but the biochar uh, mitigates the moisture even more. Wow. Okay. Know, huh? I wonder what it does to the color. I don't know. Any biochar to lime. I want to experiment now. Like it would make it gray. <laughs> yeah, it might make it gray. I don't know. Or maybe it stays in little particles of blackness. I'm not sure. Could be interesting. Maybe little yes. little streaks of black is kind of yeah. Mostly. Yeah. There's so many possibilities and, you know, the more you experiment, the more you realize that there's so many things that work and people don't really know what, what will work if they haven't tried it before and experimented. Yeah, I'm a firm believer in getting a little bit of hands-on in everything that I design with. I mean, I'm not going to try to design with a material I've never touched. And, and right. So I try to make sure I'm familiar with yeah. a wide variety of materials and techniques. And, and I hear that now they're growing mycelium to, to become building bricks. Building yeah, bricks. right. Or mm -hmm. insulation even. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Originally, I wanted to really? put in the mycelial insulation into a building I did in Southern Colorado called the Regenerative Home. Uh-huh. It was kind of a lot to organize. So we ended up, uh, you know, sort of penciling that in as a future goal. We didn't actually install it, but I did get some samples from a company called Innovative, uh, Ecovative. Yeah. And uh, very interesting materials, kind of like styrofoam, mm -hmm. a little bit spongy. Um, they have different densities. You know, there's kind of like a harder version of the mm -hmm. mycelial insulation and they have... Uh, more spongy stuff and um, I don't know how, you know how it would hold up in terms of if there's any moisture it might uh, easily uh -huh. degrade so yeah. um, you'd have to figure out how to encase it maybe encapsulate it in the clay layers okay. and it it could work yeah and since um, mycelium grows on damp straw maybe one could just um you know, make a temporary kind of cage and fill it with the damp straw and then grow the mycelium through it and then remove the chicken wire and there would be a big layer of insulation on the outside of your house. And then you could cover it with something waterproof. I might try that. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff to try, yes. I agree. Yeah, huh. yeah if we could... Um you know also working with uh, living systems like so you have something that's maybe on the exterior of the building envelope that can perform like a function maybe 
shedding water and also insulating the house more, but it could be, like you said, something alive that, you know, can last a long time. So wow. similar to an eco roof, you know, it's, you have that living layer. Mm -hmm. It's always better when it gives the, the living uh, layer of plants on the outside is it's self wow. self regenerating, you know, and that's always better. Nice. I'm letting uh, lace vine grow on the outside of some of my walls at the dome that okay. I'm tired of fixing, you know. Sure. They get the, the terrible winds and hail from the west and get pretty beat up. So, uh, you know, I think a, a layer of vines over those adobe walls really would protect them. Yeah. Good idea. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, very interesting. Uh, yeah, you see a lot of this um, stuff in, you know, the some of the permaculture design books and yeah, the blending of uh, plants with the architecture. It's, there's a lot there. There's a lot of yeah. It's great a lot to unpack. Um, yeah, I've seen some pretty interesting like living walls. Uh, very artistic, even getting. Um, different colors of plants um, in a, an arrangement to make a, a picture on the side of the wall. Wow. This is the next level, you know, once we get past wow. the this basic like structure and shelter and maintenance, then we can move into like color and beauty and right. yeah, that's where I want to go. <laughs> yeah, me yeah. too. Yeah, it's a lot of my projects, is, we had a great vision in the beginning, but then by the end, my clients are kind of tapped out and like, well, we kind of, we don't have that much more money. And, and so the artistic part really suffers because of right. uh, the budgets, uh, because they, they get the essential part done and then they have to at least put it off to do something more mm -hmm. um, expressive later on down the road. But certainly that's something that the owners can do for themselves a lot too. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah, I moved into mostly just consulting with owner builders and uh, and teaching, and I haven't done a lot of uh, you know full on like builds in, in a while. I did a couple of little sheds for people that worked on a sauna. I, I like to get my hands in there. Obviously, I enjoy that quite a bit, but. Mm -hmm. Um, it's just more efficient for me to help more people um, with the information that they need Great. and the yeah. guidance. Yeah. So. And do you that find that there's enough information out there in the world now that people can just start in on their own or they really need some personal help? Well, I just think people get, they have more confidence and then they, they get more of a clear direction, especially in the beginning um, from someone like me where it's like, okay, I'm able to assess the whole situation and point them in the right direction and their design and their methods. And then once they get going and I get them all the right materials, make sure they get it going correctly, then they're, they're cruising, they're fine. Um, and they might check in every once in a while, but it's and very helpful for people in the beginning to get the confidence. I bet have some guidance. And are these projects you're doing with them, are they um, permitted projects usually? Yeah, well, a lot of people like in Portland, for example, they want to build a little backyard getaway, like an office or a little yeah. sauna or shed, you know, and mm -hmm. so that'll be underneath the size that requires a permit. I see. That's great. Or otherwise folks sometimes do interesting things inside their house. So it's not a structural element, you know, we're just adding plasters or floors or yeah. paints, a lot of earthen paints in over drywall. It works out, it looks really beautiful. Cool. Yeah. What about you? Don't people approach you a lot for more information? And Oh, not so much these days. I just tell them, well, it's all in the book. <laughs> <laughs> that keeps it simple, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, and it's it's probably a, a pretty great move, right? To write such a wonderful book and it's been out for, gosh, quite a number of years now. So you've probably sold a wow. lot of copies. And, yeah, t since 2010. <clears throat> so, and 
you know, it's selling better now than it did in the beginning. Or at least there were some middle years in there where it wasn't selling so well. But it seems like uh, interest is peaking again. So, or at least there's more interest than there was for the last five to seven years. Mm -hmm. So that's good because, you know, it seemed kind of disappointing for a while that natural building was being forgotten about, it seemed like, for a little while. Did you experience that? Yeah, I mean, I felt like it was a huge surge, like kind of up to around 2010. And then mm -hmm. I, at least from what I was doing, it's the enrollment kind of tapered off and, mm -hmm. and I started reducing the number of workshops I was offering because they weren't filling up. Mm -hmm. um, but also in my life, I mean, I just went in some other directions for a little while. I got my own homestead and I was really focused mm -hmm. on kind of getting that hands-on experience for myself, um, especially in like home systems, um, you know, heating and cooling and, and uh, generating electricity. So I was kind of cool. trying to expand my repertoire in that direction at my own homestead and in yeah. gardening and permaculture design, you know, right. working on all that stuff. And, yeah. and uh, yeah, so I feel like that was a good thing to do, but I'm, I'm kind of glad to be free of that project now so I can give back more to the world again and be more free to, you know, move here and there. Like, like I said earlier, you know, you, you buy the farm and the, then the farm owns you, farm owns you. Yeah. <laughs> which is, can be wonderful. And it's also a little bit, you know, limiting. It holds you there. So, right. It's true. But yeah, well, um, yeah, if you could tell us, I mean, what do you envision for the the future of, uh, you know, your contributions in natural building, or or maybe uh, writing, writing more, sharing more information with people? I mean, what's what do you see for yourself? Well, I I want to do more artwork. Uh, again, I I haven't been concentrating on it the last few years and I, I want to get back to that but I've taken up music and I really enjoy that oh and, yeah and it's the dome itself that really taught me how to sing and play because the acoustics are so good okay and I I mean all those vibrational fields like you were talking about earlier are so fascinating and, and amazing in, in how they interact with biology and you know every everything is alive I believe and has consciousness and I don't know when you sing and play it just sets up this vibrational field that is really amazing I agree so, yeah. yeah so when you play so music and art you know that's what I want to do. I play I auto harp. You know, auto my fingers harp. are kind of gnarly from all the mud work I've done. So <laughs> it's a little easier to play than a lot of things. But what is an auto harp? <laughs> well, I'll show it to you. I've got it right here. Okay. Oh, cool. Yeah. They got very popular in this country in the pioneer days when um, people had to give up their pianos because they couldn't move them. And so they started manufacturing these auto harps and for a family instrument, you know, you could play it easily and sit around and sing in the evenings before there was all this high tech stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Movie okay. day. So it sort of takes the place of a piano in the Yeah. And it has three chords, I mean, three, <clears throat> three octaves, 36 strings, and 21 chords you can play. So you can play almost everything. <clears throat> Sometimes Is it electrified? Chords. Yes, I have a, a plug on it and an amp. And it sounds so much better when it's, um, when it's through the amp. Except at my dome, it sounds really good without the amp. But other places you kind of need the amp it's sort of a quiet instrument 
Yeah, but it really keeps my voice on key when I'm singing because oh, I don't yeah. have that natural ability, really, that some people do with the great ear. They are, they're always in tune and in key. <laughs> <clears throat> Not me. Yeah. I have to have my auto harp. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Me too. Me too. What yeah, do you I play? I play uh, saxophone and, oh, uh, neat. and I added the flute in my teenage years and so i still kind of dabble with that but i'm not playing with the band these days yeah. not not lately um but i enjoy it and i like singing too um, i play with my partner he plays guitar and um harmonicas yeah mm, yeah we play yeah a lot when we're in mexico okay. and and weekly here we started during the pandemic to have a you know Sundays set aside for um, practicing music, and then we give each other a massage. So oh, good plan. Pretty nice. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like you're living it up. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> right. Oh, and uh, yeah, tell us a little bit about your uh, your Mexico house you mentioned earlier. Well, we just bought this uh, little house that was for sale, and um, it's got a a uh, garden wall around it, a small garden, easy to maintain, and it's all on one floor, and it's only 300 yards from the beach, and so we roll our paddle boards down there every morning, and, or almost every morning, and go out on the waves, and, and uh, cool. it's a beautiful bay we're near, and so, yeah, we're really enjoying that. Oh, that's beautiful. Tropical life. Yeah. yeah. And and you're probably doing a little natural building there at the house at some point. Well, I want to develop some uh, raised beds on the roof. It's got a flat roof and it's it's made so that you could add on another story, but I'd rather just have outdoor space up there and and uh, try my hand at growing food in the tropics. And I think you know, insects are such a problem down there that I think a rooftop garden um, might be a good solution. And I want to make a little shade area up there where I can do some artwork too. Very cool. Yeah, yeah. I but love as far that. as the rest of the house, you know, it's all brick and cement and mm -hmm. forget it. I don't care. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, gotcha. Yeah, but I want to do some fresco panels this season. I think that's so important. And, you know, lately, the more spiritual stuff that I hear about, it's like, it's more important how you are rather than what you do. You know, like we're human beings. Just be as joyful and generous as you can. And things come to you, you know? It's, it's amazing that way. If you... You know, give a smile, whatever. It's it all comes back around. It 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 starts with with you and how you feel about things. If you're always angry, you know, you're not gonna get anywhere. You're just so gonna true. find more things to be angry about. So true. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. even even though the world as it is is frustrating, there's so much wonderful stuff too. And you just have to concentrate on the good 
things that you can do and the yeah. people you go around you. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, like what Dan Winter always says too, how uh, focused human attention has a charge hmm. to it. There's like a, a vortex of energy that comes out of our mind, our consciousness, oh. our being, when you focus attention on something, which is why, you know, right. plants or animals or people, <laughs> they, they're they more healthy when someone is paying attention to them. Yes. Um, and so the same is true for any, any energy, you know, like focusing on positivity, it's brings more positivity and for sure so on so yeah just uh whatever we pay attention to is then that's our reality that's what that's all there is and yeah you can get in different modes i notice i have my you know we're on the uh the daily grind mode you know where i'm going to work you know right. i have a a full-time job now oh wow as a building envelope consultant or a oh, local right, company right. yeah so it's pretty boring but yeah. also really interesting to see this is how things work in the mm. you know commercial industrial construction world um and i'm working with the architects and the engineers and the contractors and i see all the nitty-gritty of how things go down and it's mm it's pretty interesting because it, it's empowering ultimately for me to, to see that and then apply that knowledge to uh, helping people build their houses and mm -hmm. maybe one day building my own house. And I'm hoping to build my own house one of these days. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I have a good friend who built her own house and she's a trained architect and really did an amazing job. She made every pressed earth block herself with a thin ram. Wow. Did a double wife system, you know, two, two walls with an airspace in between. And she actually filled the airspace with insulation. Mm -hmm. And her house only need, burns half a quart of wit, wood all winter. Yeah. It just stays such a perfect temperature and has earthen floors and, you know, it's simple it feels roomy even though it's not that big you know it's about 700 square feet and i don't know she just did such a great job with it that sounds great yeah. yeah maybe i can look at some photos of that at some point i like to take notes from things that work things you know? that work yeah so the the regenerative home project that i've been working on it's over <laughs> 10 years now just oh. kind of going through iterations of design and I built uh, pretty much, you know, the first version, the first prototype is um, over there near Monte Vista, Colorado. Mm -hmm. I built that in, uh, I think it was 2010 or 2011, somewhere in there. So it's proven itself now structurally. It's been standing there this whole time and it's yeah. fine. It also has an elastomeric coating over the roof, by the oh. way. Uh -huh. but it's a it's a nubian adobe brick vault oh cool um combined with uh actually a ferro cement skin on the outside oh. uh, and that has it cracked or anything that ferro there were some cracks but they got filled in with a a little repair and some uh more elastomeric okay yeah. um so so far it's great um and there's a bunch of things that i want to change about the design now that you know over years i've been studying and gaining new techniques and evolving um well one thing is that because of the bioarchitecture principles to to reinforce the living biofield we can't have a cage or a network of metal around our bodies so we want to eliminate all rebar uh steel or aluminum from the walls and the roof or the floor of the structure if oh. possible yeah. Um, and so because of that, I wanted to take out the lath and uh, cement plaster from the design, the ferro cement part. I'm yeah. going to take that out. Yeah. Um, and that leaves me with several other options. And I, I, I tried to make the original design of the regenerative home 
all earthen as much as possible. So it is 98% of the structure of that building is just Adobe, great. which is great. But now we need to figure out how to, you know, waterproof and reinforce the roof so that it's, um, I think it's strong enough as is with a Caternary arch and a Nubian vault. It's, it is quite strong, but we want people to also trust it. Yeah. Uh, so um, I'm moving toward using uh, what they call a Catalan vault or a timbrel vault, which is uh, those uh, ceramic low fire thin tile bricks mm. uh, set into a vault shape with cement um, and then laid three layers thick of tiles that are offset from one another. So it's like mm -hmm. woven sort of like a basket. Right. And those vaults, uh, also known as Guastavino vaults, mm -hmm. they're incredibly strong. Some of them have been standing for hundreds of years, yeah. very little maintenance, um, withstanding earthquakes and natural disasters. And so I think combining the Catalan vault with um, heavy, wide, like rammed earth or cob walls um, or adobe brick walls is a great way to go. Um, and would you figure out some insulation for that roof? Right. And so and that's the next step is, you know, how exactly are we going to insulate it? And so far I'm thinking about just doing like a double, a double vault with insulation between mm -hmm. the upper and lower vault. And likewise for the walls. I mean, we end up with a, a very thick wall, but it's a high mass on the yeah. inside and then a insulation layer and then a thinner outer wall that's your protective layer well i think the the hempcrete you know even though they call it crete it's hemp and lime i was thinking you know that would have been a brilliant solution to my adobe dome if i had put a layer of that and then put the elastomeric over that okay yeah. you know that's yeah. pretty quick and easy yeah, and I did something similar in the original prototype for the regenerative home. It was um, like a pumice clay. I've tried pumice in clay too, and I, I wasn't real thrilled with the insulative value. Okay. Which is a shame because I really had high hopes that pumice, you know, was such a great insulator, but I don't know. The, the pumice I used. Well, well, it was more scoria than pumice. You know, it comes in different types. And the scoria yeah. is, is that red stuff they put on the road. And even though it looks like it has a lot of holes in it all, it, um, it might not have the insulative value of those little gray yeah. particles. I was using it. more like that white stuff that you would see mixed into like a, a potting soil mix. Oh. And so oh, it's very, light, it's very light, you know. Yeah, it's similar to vermiculite. vermiculite. Oh, yeah, that this would is be like a, it's a, it's a pumice, but um, better. But you know, when you mix it with the binder, that binder does fill in a lot of those holes. Right. So it's not it's not as insulative as you know, a insulation product like a rigid foam or. Right. Um, so like you're. Typically, you know, your bad insulation or your rigid foam insulation, you're looking at, uh, I don't know, R5 per inch or something like that, you know. And I think yeah. that your pumice clay or pumice crete or even your hemp crete is more in the realm of like R1 per inch or R2 well, per inch. All... Yeah. Um, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm, don't quote me on that because I, I need to look it up for the hemp crete. I know it's. I think the hemp is, is, has a, a little higher rating. But it's definitely not as high as you know some of these like closed cell foams or right. um, polyisocyanurate. You know, it's a very typical product. Um, but um, but yeah, you just have to make it thicker. Basically, I mean, yeah, we successfully use natural materials. We have to the form has to follow the function, right? And and then uh, and then some of these counties they'll allow you to put more insulation on like the north side. And less insulation on the south side, and we talked about this earlier. How mm -hmm. sometimes they don't allow that, and it's just silly. But there's there's certain places where you can kind of you go for the overall insulative value around all four walls and roof. Yeah, 
and that if you can get an overall amount, you can reduce insulation on the south side, which makes sense. Right. Where you can uh, then absorb the solar energy and uh, and not have such a thick wall, have more of a high mass wall on the south side. Yeah, and you really want that mass to pick up the solar rays. Yeah, yeah. And now the regenerative home or that type of home, you know, I went and I took a workshop with Earthship Biotexture and and I, I'm inspired by, you know, the fact that they even did it is, is cool, but I didn't really like the structural aspect of what they're producing right. for my taste. You know, I wanted to keep it more into the natural materials. Um, yeah. So I took all the systems that they are promoting and I learned a lot from that. And I decided to transfer that into the regenerative home design, which right. like I said, is all Adobe type structure. So yeah. you're still looking at, um, all glass on the south side mm -hmm. um, and then a double layer like an entryway it's all glass you come inside mm -hmm. and then there's another wall of glass oh that's you really have that double wall of glass entry entry room which is also a greenhouse yeah and you would go through there into the, the living room which is much more protected back in there but the sunlight still gets in cool so anyway <laughs> just, yeah. just throwing out ideas but to me it's exciting it's like yeah you can accomplish a lot with the design um right and a lot of things have been tried and there's a lot of things that haven't been tried yet uh so it, it's exciting and there's there's so many new options and materials out there now there's like uh etfe is a um it's a fluoropolymer uh glazing so it's a flexible like plasticky kind of window material Wow. Um, that lets in, I think it's like 90%, 99% of the light spectrum. Wow, um, that's which great. Is quite a bit more than your average uh, glass windows. So that <laughs> means, and they're also super durable. So the material lasts maybe not as long as like a glass itself, but very long time, maybe, you know, hundreds of years. Wonderful. Because so the ultraviolet light doesn't really hit the molecules oh. it doesn't get the ultraviolet degradation that most other materials get but because of this material lets in so much light it opens up new possibilities yeah so for you know how much energy is going through the the glazing and then hitting your trom wall on the other side or your solar heat absorption of some kind you know it's very exciting so. and who's manufacturing these are they being manufactured? Yeah, yet? I don't know. I, I've seen a few companies making the ETFE. Um, it is very expensive. Oh. So that's like the downside. For right now, it's still pretty expensive stuff. Yeah. More expensive than glass. Well, I've been e experimenting with a new um, greenhouse wall system for like the the ends of the greenhouse or, or for various places. And that is uh, a bottle wall, but instead of using um, other materials, I use um, lime putty mixed with uh, paper pulp. And you can use uh, recycled shredded office paper, or you can use paper insulation mm -hmm. or, or whatever kind of paper you can get. But the beauty of that is that the paper absorb so much water that when you mix it with the lime putty it dries slowly and it sets without cracking because in the desert at least lime plaster becomes such a problem uh, with drying too fast and cracking mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and keeping it damp is very difficult in the for you know five days or however long it takes to cure it Mm -hmm. So this system has worked really well for bottle walls, and I've, I've used it in a couple of greenhouse applications. And it sticks so well to glass, and you can use pieces of glass in it too, instead of all bottles, and, and just set your broken window in there and surround it with the lime paper mix. Anyway. Oh, yeah, very cool. Yeah, and it's, it's practically free. You know, and it recycles bottles and. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I used to put um, this paper fibers 
and we'd get at like the document shredding company. We'd go there and get this bag of paper dust and then oh, mix nice. it into uh, earthen plasters for interior. Yeah. And it's super lightweight and kind of yeah. like a foam or something. It's very different texture. It's very, uh, very light, very sculptural, uh-huh. um, kind of like paper clay from ceramics. Right. It has similar qualities. Um, but I never have tried mixing that with lime. That would, that would be great. It's a good combination. So what's yes. your ratio? Do you remember the ratio? Well, with lime putty, you want three parts of something else. <clears throat> you know, so sometimes I mix a little pumice with it too, or pozzolanic compound, you know, dust, and um, and a little sand. But But really, you could use all paper pulp and then just mix up enough lime putty to make it all stick together and it seems to work really well cool that is something i will try and it's so tough you know the weather doesn't bother it a bit Uh and and that's the problem with bottle walls if you use mud mortar you know they're a a little more vulnerable and you don't want to use cement it's we don't want to use cement so so the lime putty solution is uh, working out real well for me that is great yeah i i'm not sure everybody knows but i've been talking about this for 20 years how you know we we avoid portland cement for a few reasons and it's super high embodied energy there are a lot of additive chemicals in that mixture that some of them are heavy metals um there's a lot of things that you don't want to touch or breathe or have next to your garden bed yeah. in that mixture. And uh, we kind of have gotten a little too comfortable with Portland cement because it's so ubiquitous. I mean, it's the second most used uh, chemical by humanity on earth next to water. Yeah. So we use, we use fresh water. And then second to that is Portland cement. <laughs> so there's something wrong with this picture, guys. Really? We're paving over the whole world, you know. Uh, yeah, it's just they, they paved paradise and put up a parking lot, you know. And I'm afraid so. So we kind of, uh, you know, at least do our part to um, at least educate one another about that reality. And um, and there are a lot of alternatives. There's uh, mm-hmm. lime, you know, which also has a pretty high embodied energy, but it's a much yeah, much closer to the earth product. I mean, it's you take the the lime mineral out of the earth and they burn it at a certain temperature. It's lower than the temperatures they burn the Portland cement chemicals at. Um, mm-hmm. And then they don't add anything else to it. It's just, right. that's how lime is. It's fairly uh, natural product ultimately. Um, and then you have things like natural cement, uh, which is very uh, uncommon, but uh, there are certain deposits in the earth where they're digging out a certain combination of minerals and pozzolans, uh, volcanic uh, materials that then they burn similar to lime at a low temperature, like 1200 degrees, and it creates a, a, what they call natural cement. Um, and it's, it's super strong. It's actually uh, a lot stronger than Portland cement and sets very quickly. Um, that's what they use for the Catalan vaults. Um, you stick the bricks together so it's kind of like an instant glue you okay. put the brick there and you hold it and then within 10 or 15 seconds it holds itself there because um, the clay brick pulls the moisture out so quickly exactly yeah and uh so natural cement is a great option it's also kind of expensive because they're, they're shipping it around and it's they're smaller companies that are making it um, but I see that as a, as a great option, something I'm experimenting with. And, and then there's magnesium cements, like magnesium phosphorus cements. Um, again, they're a little more expensive because they're not manufacturing them on a, such a large scale. But uh, magnesium cements are typically, you know, three to five times stronger than Portland cement. Mm-hmm. I got a lot more stick to them. You know, they really stick onto things um, and they set also quite rapidly typically it's like a 20 minute set time so i mean it's just kind of overcoming the the challenges with using some of these alternative cements um, then there's geopolymers i mean we can 
the list goes on and on but the geopolymers is the oldest you know like roman cements and mm. cements they used to make the great pyramids and and other structures ancient structures are mixtures of kaolins different types of clays and uh, high magnesium soils with um, different uh, magnesium and phosphorus combinations and and somehow what ends up happening is the molecules arrange themselves in a crystalline lattice as the masonry is drying out oh. and setting up and because of that lattice it's many times stronger than just a uh, kaolin adobe you know it ends up having this um, and there's also i think alumina compounds in there alumina oxide anyway many oxides of met of metallic oxides which are chemicals you could find in the, in the earth in different places you can mix those in and they add strength but ultimately a geopolymer could be stronger and stronger over time it would just get the longer that it's there, the stronger it gets. And I think lime is sort of similar, would you say? Like, yeah, it gets harder and harder, more like a stone. Yeah, it gets more like limestone over time. Good stuff, people need to know. I'm so glad that all this stuff is getting relearned, you know, because so much of, has been forgotten over time and we just have yeah. to keep, keep that old knowledge alive and revived. And Definitely. now all the biological stuff, we just learn more and more every day. It's wonderful. Definitely. Yeah, just we're just remembering. Yeah. Well, I think probably our time's up, don't you? We need to get yeah. to Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure we, we got <laughs> other things to do today, but it's just been such a pleasure catching up with you, Carol. And thanks for being on the show. I so appreciate it. Thank you, Scott. I really appreciate what you're doing for the natural building movement. Yeah, it's wonderful. Yeah. We're, we're in it together. Yeah. So thank you. All right. Thank you. Have a wonderful I'll, day. I'll send you some photos. Okay. Okay. We'll talk to you soon. All right. Bye-bye.